Embracing uncertainty was a presentation that I gave in New Delhi a couple of weeks ago, and I thought it might be useful for me at least to go back right now and to take a look at what some of the ideas were inside of that and see if I can't pull them together in a 10 minute piece and see, give it to you guys and see if I can't get some feedback. So embracing uncertainty, rhizomatic learning and formal education. It's, a, it's an attempt at trying to envision how to answer the question, why do we teach? And that presentation was really about pulling together five things that I thought, I think, about how to answer that question and how rhizomatic learning in some ways can be an answer to that question. So to me, the first place that I always start when I think about learning and why I, I'm involved in the education and why it's important to me are these two guys. So this is Posey on the right and Oscar on the left, and they're my little guys. And, and for me, thinking about the learning process and watching them learn is always a fascinating sort of counterpoint to the work that I do in higher ed and to the work that I do online and trying to see how they come through their own world. And one of the things that I was thinking about was how there are some really primal lessons that we get involved in when we teach little kids. And, and really, these are lessons that go across cultures and they go across time. So this the question of how we deal with fire is one of those things that we, you know, I'm dealing with with my kids right now. They're three and six years old or almost six. And they are walking by the stove and hold back and, and things are hot and you're trying to explain to them how that goes. And we have this expression that the burnt hand teaches best, right? Well, obviously we're not out there quite burning children, but it does give this sense that there is an experiential nature to learning and that's something that's been around for a long time. You know, this expression's been with us for a while. Um, but the problem with that, and I think the way, one of the ways in which our world is complexified and the ways in which our lessons need to be adapted is that at one time, it really was just fire we were talking about, right? There's really just the places where, where fire existed and then it gets more complicated. We get inside of houses and then there's other things that are hot. And we get into a world where that uncertainty about heat is there. So maybe it's steam that comes out as the hot thing. So it's not just the fire, it's the steam and the burnt hand on the fire or on the stove doesn't quite warn you you know, for the steam that might be coming out or the hot car engine or whatever else is out there. So the question becomes the, the burnt hand teaches best. What's really being taught there? So is it that fire is hot and don't touch it? And I mean, there's a behaviorist sort of lesson there, I guess. And, and I guess it's a lesson you're probably going to learn because we don't want to touch it. And, and maybe the second lesson that's built under there is when you say a burnt hand teaches best, to some degree, you're saying you should do what you're told. You know, had you done what you were told, this thing would not have happened to you. And I think of that as an undercurrent to that message. But the third piece to that, and the one that I'm interested in for my kids, and the one that sort of is a, the foundation that I'm presenting here for rhizomatic learning, and, and this idea of uncertainty, is things are hot and we should check for them. So in learning that things could be hot, you can check for them in the future. You can prepare yourself for an uncertain world where things may or may not be hot and you can learn how to approach those things and, and not touch them or get close to them and feel the heat emanating from them and know that those things should be checked for. So ideally what I'm doing is preparing my kids, not by letting them touch all the hot things to know that they're hot, but to realize that things can be hot and then that's one of the, the various complexities of the world that they live in. So of the five things I think I think, the best teaching prepares people for dealing with uncertainty. And that's sort of what I'm presenting as one of the potential core pieces of rhizomatic learning is that what we're doing is trying to prepare people for uncertainty. EdTech Talk is really, it's an online community of webcasters, educators who come together, talk about their practice. We've been doing this for six or seven years. There've been, I don't know, 12, 13, 1400 radio shows. And it started in 2005, where we all got together on the website and, and got together on these live shows to start talking about our practice. Now, if you remember, in 2005, we had YouTube just starting up and, you know, WordPress was coming in and we had a really great blogging platform that we could use. And we had all these new things that were coming at us in education and technology that nobody really had an answer for. How are we supposed to use that? What's the best way of doing this in our classroom? How can I make sure that my kids are safe? And these are questions we had no idea about. There were no books to buy. There was no place to go for reference. So reasonably, the only thing we could do 
was come together and talk about it. And what we found out as that went along is that just by coming together and talking about it, we were learning. There was no set pattern for it. There was no agenda. There was no curriculum set out. Um, but yet, when I went to a meeting and started having a conversation about something, the things that had come into the conversation, the connections that I'd made, came together to give me answers. And I think that that piece, that idea that the community can be the curriculum, that to learning when there's no answer, when you're not sure what the answer is going to be, where the complexity gets in the way, where you get to the point where nobody knows what the best way is. Maybe there isn't a best way. And at that point, the community really can be the curriculum. You can all come together to learn together. There doesn't need to be an outside source of knowledge. So the response I normally get at this point is that, yeah, yeah, that's network learning. We understand. You know, that's the sort of thing that, that lots of people are talking about. And to some degree, I agree. But to me, rhizomatic learning is a particular kind. A rhizome is a particular kind of network. And I like to sort of drop down into the rhizome metaphor here a little bit and, and sort of take a look at it. If you look at these models and networks, and this is just a random page pulled off of, uh, of Google Images to try to pull together that idea, you'll notice that the majority of these networks are very tidy. They're all point to point. All the lines are connected. And it gives you this idea that the connections involved are really clean ones. You know, the, there's one in the top right hand corner that's kind of mooshed together. But if you zoom in on it, you can actually see that it's all dots and lines. And the same with the bottom left hand corner. There's a lot there, but it's dots and lines and all the dots are connected to lines. And there's a sense of tidiness about that process that to me somehow implies that the learning process is tidy, that the model is out there, that all we need to do is know what that model is, and once we have it, we'll be fine. And the rhizome presents a different kind of model to that, or at least it focuses in on a special kind of network. So these, these trees that you're seeing in front of you, the aspens, they grow, that's actually one plant, right? And they grow underground, the largest aspen grove is I think it's 106 miles and square miles and it just kind of spreads out and the shoots go down and they run across and they shoot up in different locations there's no real start to the plant there's no real end to it it's not a tidy structure right you begin wherever you are and you follow the plant around right that there's no necessary point where all the points are connected to lines you can cut a whole piece out move it somewhere else so it can continue to grow right it's not a neat, tidy network. This is another example of a rhizome. These are bamboo shoots, and you can see how where the rhizomes go out, they're the sort of medium thick parts. When they come out and spread over, they go in, in different directions, so they don't necessarily, and you can break off a piece and walk it away and drop it somewhere else, and it will still continue to grow. So there's some nice qualities about rhizomes that make them interesting to think about as ways in which things are connected. So they can map in any direction from any starting point. So there's no, there's no set beautiful circle or ways in which it's tidy and neat. They just take off in the directions. They fit into, into an ecosystem, right? They adapt to the ecosystem around them. They grow and spread via experimentation. So they'll try out this way. Maybe they run into a rock. Maybe it turns a corner. Maybe it hits a wall. But it ends up reaching out its tendril and trying to figure out whether it can find a place to grow, whether the nutrients are there, whether that's a direction that's going to work out. And again, I think this is a really nice metaphor for the learning process. And they grow and spread regardless of breakage. So you can snap and twist them. And if any of you who've ever had a nasty rhizome, like a Japanese knotweed or a bishop's weed in your, in your garden, you'll know that the tiniest little bit of it's enough to make it grow. And there's something really nice about that, too, in thinking about network models, I think, when we talk about learning. The tidy network model, to me, gives this sense that when we have a group of learners together and they're working as a network, if a piece breaks off, that piece that they were connected to is going away. Whereas if you think it as something more organic, something that can work when it's broken and misplaced or put in a new location, it gives it a new chance to grow. And I like that kind of model as well. So the rhizome, the third thing is the rhizome is a model for learning and for, for learning for uncertainty. So I guess what are we going to do this kind of learning for? And I've heard this uh, probably half a dozen times at presentations where people will say, I don't want my doctor learning this way. 
You know, I don't want this kind of community generated knowledge stuff. There are things that are true and things that aren't true. And, and we should be out there learning those things. I mean, I'm certainly not saying that there aren't things we should learn, things that we should memorize, things that are not just about connecting to a community, although a community would be a good place to find out where those things, what those things are. But there are some basic ideas, and whether they be language or whether they be best practices, that underwrite any kind of context. So this is a model. This is the Kinevin framework. It's a simplified version of that model by Dave Snowden. And what it talks about is how people make decisions in management. So we talk about simple, complicated, complex, and chaotic decision making. We think about this in the context of learning. A simple piece would be something you can memorize, something that a simple decision where we can all agree on what's true and what's not true. So we can all agree that this thing over here is called a mouse. We can all agree that this is a computer and that these are words and, and languages that are useful for us to all kind of agree on. And there are ways in which we have sort of automated responses to things that, that make our lives easier. So we point at things and we agree that there are certain things. And that's a good thing. And I think in any context, in any sort of grouping of learning, it's important to get those simple things agreed upon. And I think anybody who's moving to a new field for the first time has to gather some of that information. Um, whether they need to gather it first is a different conversation, but they certainly do need it. The second zone in the top right hand corner, complicated, is more of a, um, it, they call, it's good practice. So if um, maybe I've hurt my shoulder and we look back to our doctor example, if I've hurt my shoulder, well, I could have it sewn back together or I could do physio. And they're both reasonably good practices and there are reasons to do one or the other. And if you look really close at it and you bring an expert in, that person is going to be able to give you an evaluation and odds are there's one or two or three or four different ways to do it. And those things are, are things that can be sorted out and decided between. Not necessarily there's one best answer, but like I've broken my leg, I need to put a cast on it. But you know, there's a couple of options and choosing between them is something that we can do. The complex domain is really the one that where the uncertainty lives. You know, it's the place where we don't know what the answer is. We have to do as, as Dave describes probe, sense, and response. So you need to try something, check it out, see if this thing is going to work out. And if it starts to be a little better, you do more of it. If it starts to do less, you do less of it. So imagine somebody with uh, chronic headache pain, for instance. You don't necessarily know what the cause is. You don't necessarily know what's going to help. You might try a little bit of vacation. You might try a little bit of physio. You might try something else and try bits and pieces, see what works, and then do a little bit more of that as that goes through. Those kinds of things are far more ex about experience, about trial and error, and about trying to keep a general sense of what the possibilities are. Now that chaotic domain down there is more about acting right away. And I think that there are different, there are kinds of learning where you simply need a simple piece of information. You need it right now, you need to do something, right? That's a different phase again. So when we look at, in the literature, and we look at the way some people are starting to talk about it, to take a medical example, um, successful health services in the 21st century must aim not merely to change for change, improvement, and response, but for changeability, improvability, and responsiveness. And again, I argue that to have that inside of a system, we can't be teaching people what's right and what's wrong. We need to be preparing them for uncertainty. We need them to be reaching out as part of that community and think of their learning and their knowledge as part of that community growth and seeing it change along with everyone else around them. And this is one from management. This comes from uh, Dave Snowden's Cognitive Edge, uh, written by Gary Wong. When you finally come to grips, you can't solve today's problems using present methods. You take the lead to venture into the complex domain. You initiate a search, rally followers, and try out these different things to see if you can change the paradigm. And again, it's that same idea that at some point you get to the place where uncertainty is what you're confronting. And I think of that as the important part of learning. It's the place where you need to be prepared to be able to make those kinds of decisions. And I think of an education system that has definitive answers, that has, that offers up a scenario in which somebody can get something right rather than make decisions between a variety of options is one that does not prepare people for those kinds of uncertainties. So, and that rhizomatic learning, that, that sort of exploratory probe sense respond kind of learning where you're in the complex domain where answers aren't clear 
is one I'm talking about, rhizomatic learning being best for. So I guess the final question is, is how do you do this on purpose? So how do you actually go out structuring an environment where everybody has sort of the ability to probe and sense and respond and the learners are able to react to their own environment and they're able to follow their own learning paths and, and still be connected as a community and you don't have a pre-established curriculum and that's something that gets built out over the course. How do you actually do that in any kind of practical sense? So with my children, this is a picture of Oscar again, trying to set up scenarios where you know, it's not a right and wrong answer where you can actually uh, grow and develop. And this is something I catch myself doing all the time, right? You know, I've got a, my boy who's almost six and I try to, you know, set up these, or engage with these really interesting learning experiences with them. And then I find myself going, what's the answer to that, Oscar? Um, what's three times three? What? And I set up environments where the right answer is the thing that he needs to sing song back to me. And again, he starts to learn that the world is a place where answers are right or wrong. And if he gets them right, he gets rewarded. If he's wrong, they're not rewarded. Where, in my experience, the most valuable things in the world are places where you need to make decisions between things that aren't right and wrong. You know, um, and, and I find myself constantly struggling with that. And I think for me. The lesson for rhizomatic learning, which I'm constantly trying to relearn, is to try to make those conversations more complex, to offer complexity to him and let him make his own sort of explorations inside that uncertainty. This ED366 is the course that I teach at the University of Prince Edward Island, uh, Educational Technology and the Adult Learner. If you're interested, if you do a search for that online, you'll see the syllabus that I have set up for it. Um, trying to set it up for that course is... Uh, it's a challenge, um, but and because I get students from all over, some of them are teachers, some of them are trainers, some of them are faculty, some of them are people interested in teaching. So they come from all different walks of life, and we start without a curriculum, and, and really they have to build their own. They have to build their own learning network plan, and the goal for that plan in that course is that they're planning for themselves six months away. So how can you set up a sort of a, a textbook for you so that six months from now when you're trying to do something that has to do with technology or has to do with trying to put together, understand one of these new concepts, that you'll have something to work from so that you've built it up yourself and it fits for your context. And it's particularly useful for this group because they come from such different liter levels of literacies, both digital literacies and, and all kinds of different stuff. So um, ends up being a real challenge. And for those of you who are familiar with the MOOCs, this structure for MOOCs, again, is designed to allow for that kind of flexibility. So this is from Five Steps to, five steps to Succeed in a MOOC, which you can see. It's a four-minute video that you can see if you search it on YouTube. Orient, declare, network, cluster, and focus. So go out, find yourself, find your place uh, inside of one of these MOOCs, inside of one of these open courses. Declare yourself so people know you're there. Start to find people to work with. Find groups, like a community that can slowly start to form, and then focus on your own work so that that community can become your curriculum, and then you're driving yourself towards the goals that you set for yourself. So that sense of responsibility, that point where you are setting your own step, where I, I put Oscar, my son, in the place where he has to make decisions for himself that aren't just about me parroting a right or wrong solution to him, where my students are actually focused on their own learning and their own goals, and where the individual student in a MOOC is looking towards their own focus, you know, as part of that community, but the thing that they're trying to get done, those are all about putting the responsibility for learning back on top of the student, right? And again, it's not only their own learning, but also when we're working with communities, the learning of those people around you. So as this was a presentation in India, the question there is always, how does this scale? You know, maybe you can do it with those with your son over there. And maybe you can do it with those 20 people in your classroom. But what do we do when the numbers get big? What do you do when you bureaucratize that across a country? Say, you know, there's three million teachers in the United States. How do you do this stuff across the way? Well, for me, we need to stop measuring. We, the, people are always saying that they need to measure learning. And in this kind of of scenario in this kind of environment is extraordinarily differ, difficult to do what people call measure learning. So if everybody's doing something different, how do I know what one person has learned? How do I know how this other person is doing? How can I guarantee that that classroom or that school is actually doing something there, right? 
because they need to measure learning. And my argument to that is always the same. The fact that you need to measure learning doesn't mean that it's possible. You know, I understand that people think they need to measure it, but I don't think it's possible to measure learning. And then when I said this in the, in the presentation, somebody said, well, you can sort of check to see if some of the effects of learning have happened. So, you know, if somebody's learned to drive a car, you can tell that they're driving it. And I was like, well, kind of. And you can measure around learning, but trying to measure whether or not learning has happened to me is a red herring. And I think we should stop trying to measure learning altogether. You know, if we're trying to measure that someone actually has something in their head, we're getting people to cram, right? So that they're right before the test and they try to jam everything in and it's gone three days later. In my mind, that's like cheating, right? Yes, you were able to produce it on a test, but you haven't actually learned it. You've just remembered it for a couple of days and now it's gone. So you never made it as part of who you are. You never brought it into your context. You never connected it to those other things you know. You just were able to reproduce it based on the testing structure that I set up for you. That to me is not learning. Um, it does prove that you were able to reproduce it, but I don't think of that as learning. So to me, we need to stop that idea of measuring learning and start measuring things like effort and engagement and connection and people's ability to talk about the ways in which the things they have connect to the other pieces that they have. And we can let the robots count the rest of those pieces, you know, how many contacts they've made and whether or not they've researched stuff. There's a lot of things we can count in terms of clicks, but I think we also need to trust those teachers to look at people and say, you know, that person is getting it. I can understand that. And the teachers that I know can answer that question. I think trusting the teacher is another really big part of this. So if we can make the community the curriculum, membership in that community becomes how we scale. Cheers.